Hello and welcome to the lab. Today what I have for you is a demonstration of the greatly improved multiple instrument capabilities in Gelscope Client. For our first experiment today, we're going to be taking a look at this TI retimer chip, which is configured on this board to generate a PRBS for length testing. When we reconfigure the device, so for example, if I hit this button, we can toggle between PRBS 9 and PRBS 31 patterns. We will notice that the output of the retimer drops briefly, and we would like to study this dynamic behavior and see exactly what commands are being sent to the device that causes the length to drop, and what the actual behavior of the output pattern is as it comes and goes. The problem is that we're looking at very different timescales here. The output of this can be as high as 10 gigabits per second, and uh, the control bus to it is I squared C at a couple hundred kilohertz. And so if you use a single oscilloscope with any reasonable amount of memory, you can either sample slow enough to see the I squared C with uh, a long capture buffer at low sample rate, or you can sample at a much higher rate, you can see the high speed output, but then you lose the slow stuff. So what we have looking at the high speed output is this 16 gigahertz LaCroix SDA-16. This cable connects to the output of the retimer through a couple of cables. On the other end, we've got these probes connected to the Picoscope 6800 series looking at the S squared C bus. So the first step is connecting to our primary scope. This is going to be our LaCroix SDA. This is the instrument that we're using as the time reference for everything else in the system. We can get rid of those other channels. We don't care about them. At the moment, we are looking at two megaline points at 40 giga samples per second with PRBS1 output at 1.25 gigabits per second. And uh, right now we're using a simple level trigger, so we're just toggling on transitions. And if we switch the trigger to a dropout at say five microseconds on a falling edge, that should be good. You'll see that whenever I hit one of the buttons to reconfigure the signal generator, our waveform stabilizes at a constant level for a little bit, then spikes up, goes away, and does all sorts of other weird things. And so we would like to understand what's causing this behavior. So going back to the edge trigger again. Now we're going to connect our secondary instrument. You can have arbitrarily many secondaries. Right now we're just going to be using one. And we have the cross trigger connected to channel A on the Picoscope. And so let's get that set up. So now we're just looking at our cross trigger pulse, nothing super exciting. Next up is going to be the PRBS as seen by the Picoscope. This is what we're going to be using as our synchronization reference since both scopes can see it. Both scopes are connected with three feet of the same coax to a splitter that is connected to the output of the pulse generator. And so we're going to essentially be de-skewing the two scopes to the front panel reference plane. So the front panel B and C's will both see waveforms at the same time. And we want to set our sample rate to something fairly high to look at uh, PRBS. So we'll do five examples. And now, zooming in, we can see that we are nowhere near synchronized. We've got a big low area here, a low area here, then this high area doesn't seem to match anything like that. So we're, we're not even close to a line, which is to be expected. So just to check how far out of sync we are, we're going to switch back to the dropout trigger again. Microseconds on a falling edge. And we can see that the picoscope is triggering way late. We've got our waveform is already starting to fall off, and we're just beginning to see it here. So we can drag the virtual trigger from the picoscope back a little bit. Note I did say virtual trigger. So in a multi-scope setup in Geoscope Client, the actual physical trigger signal is coming through potentially several feet or more 
of K balls. In this case, we've actually got a fairly complex cascade trigger that flies by the other instruments we're going to be using later in this experiment as well. And uh, so we don't care about when this long delay trigger pulse after all the latency in the system reaches us. We only care about the logical trigger, which for the secondary is the start of the acquisition. And so we can just go drag this arrow to move the start of our acquisition in time anywhere we want. And you'll notice even though I moved back starting point, the waveform didn't move in the timeline because the relative synchronization of these is still fixed. Now we haven't de-skewed them, so we can see there's a huge offset between them. But the positioning is fixed, and as we adjust the trigger here, that's not going to change. So what I'm doing now is adjusting the trigger position of a secondary scope to be somewhat close to the primary. Um, it does not need to be exactly sync. That's what the auto sync wizard is for. However, the search window is only 10,000 points right now. And uh, as a result, at 40 gig samples per second, that only gives us uh, a plus or minus 250 nanosecond search radius. And so we need to have the two waveforms within 250 nanoseconds of the same position in order for the cross correlations to be able to find our local maximum, which should be when we're fully synced. And uh, once we have that initial sync, we can change snap rates, we can change trigger positions, we can do whatever we want. You can increase the search radius, but doing so greatly increases the time it takes to maintain sync. Uh, this is still something that I'm going to be experimenting with. There's going to be a bunch of optimizations, probably pushing some of the correlations to GPU, and that'll likely greatly increase the available search radius at the same time. So we're at about 22 microseconds of pre-trigger there. And we're at about 18 there. So let's move this back another couple of microseconds. And a little bit more. Probably about that should be good. So we're at 21.9 there. And... Let's, let's just go just a little bit further. All right, so that's 22.4 and 22.4. All right, that, that looks close enough. All right, so again, we are not synced on the timeline yet. We haven't calibrated out the trigger propagation delay. We're just trying to get both instruments showing about the same waveform. And so before we can sync, we do need a free running trigger. So we're going to switch away from the dropout and back to a uh, simple edge trigger. So now the sync is going to be able to work with whatever we're looking at. And uh, I'm also going to switch from PRBS 9 out to PRBS 31. PRBS 9 has a fairly short repetition period. So it is possible to get stuck in a local maximum syncing to uh, another copy of the same bit pattern. So it is preferable to use a longer period PRBS or a single edge anything that has essentially one correct cross correlation. So now I'm just going to select setup instrument sync. We've already got our secondary trigger to go on A, but we can change that here if we want. And our primary reference is channel four of the SDA and our secondary is channel E of the picoscope. So now it's just going to sit back and crunch a little bit, collecting 10 waveforms and uh, finding correlations between them and determining what our actual offset is going to be. One other thing I am going to mention at this point is that the choice of primary instrument definitely is important. Um, specifically, stability of the trigger is important. So with this particular uh, LaCroix SDA-816, I've noticed there is some jitter in the trigger between when the trigger event happens and uh, when the trigger out pulse is actually emitted when using any of the clock recovery triggers. Uh, my guess is this is because the pattern matching actually runs at a lower clock rate on the trigger FPGA internally. And so because of this clock domain crossing, uh, you end up having the trigger occurring at a edge of a lower frequency clock internally, and so this can lead to jitter. Uh, I am looking at ways to correct this in software, maybe by having the primary look at a loopback of the trigger pulse. Anyway, through the magic of editing, we are now done waiting. And now I'm going to switch back to PRBS 9, just so it's a little bit easier to see the uh, patterns are synced. So again, we've got a edge here, 
got an edge here, and everything is nicely lined up. So now that the instruments are synced, we can work on our actual debug. First thing is we're going to want the Pico scope to be triggering at a much lower rate. The whole reason of using the two scopes is because we're working on signals with vastly different order magnitude time scales. So we're going to drop down to say 300 mega samples per second. So we're about two orders of magnitude slower than uh, the SDIA sampling. And we're going to bump out to say 20 million points. And so uh, this is the equivalent of what we would see if we had two gigapoints of memory on the SDA. And notice the picoscope is still only at uh, uh, 20 million points of memory, and so we could very easily look at much, much longer timescales this way. And we're not even using that low of a sample rate. 300 mega samples per second is gross overkill for I2C. So speaking of I2C, let's go and actually add the channels for that. So channel D is uh, looking at SDA. And that is a 10x probe. And channel G is our SCL. And that is also a 10x probe. So we're going to get those just roughly positioned on screen. And I'm going to switch back to the dropout trigger on the SDA so we can see when our waveform has gone away. Falling edge. And now we're synced and we can see some I2C traffic and then the waveform comes back. Uh, we really want to see what's leading up to this though. So I'm going to pull our trigger on the Picoscope way back. Let's do, say, 15 milliseconds early. And now, if I generate another event, we can see our signal is present. The first couple of I2C transactions don't seem to do anything. Then it drops out. Then it comes back with this weird artifact. And then it finally stabilizes. And so if we want, we can do a protocol decode on here. So we're just going to do a threshold at 1.65. That's half our supply voltage. And then threshold here as well. And then we can decode the I squared C. And we can see we've got all of the register writes going to various configuration on the read timer. If we wanted, we could write a protocol decoder that would take these register writes and turn them back into higher level stuff, or we could just reference the data sheet to understand exactly what's going on. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not going to bother actually cracking all these registers to figure out which one is causing the output to go away. But just to, again, illustrate the advantage of this setup, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. And again, there's essentially nothing visible in the picoscope output with the SDA. We've still got nice clear edges. And let's turn the data rate up a little bit just for kicks. So now at 10 gigabits per second, we see absolutely nothing looking at the picoscope output. We're undersampling so much it's horrifically aliased. And uh, we still do have the advantage of being able to see again the long term behavior. We can't see any of the toggles, but we can see roughly when the signal comes and goes. And then if we zoom back in all the way here, we can still see nice clear data on the SDA at 40 giga samples per second. So I think that should be it for this experiment. Let's continue with another one. For our second experiment, we're going to be looking at a Xilinx Zinc dev board from Digilent that boots off of Quad Spy Flash. It may be difficult to see through all the spaghetti, but we have six probes in the flash, three on this side, three on this side. Some of them are standard 10x RC divider probes. Some of them are transmission line probes. And uh, they are connected to four different oscilloscopes. The McCroy SDA over here, the WaveRunner 8000 over here, the Siglent 6000, and the Picoscope 6000. 
I was hoping to show off the Analog Discovery Pro looking at one of the power rails or some of the slower status lines. Unfortunately, I physically could not fit any more probes onto the board. There is nowhere to put one, and so I had to stop at six channels. Uh, this is one of the areas where soldering probes really comes in handy, but I don't have any high impedance soldering probes that can handle 3.3 volt logic, so we'll have to live with that. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with all of the configuration of the protocol decodes and de-skewing all of the channels with three secondary scopes. That does take a fair bit of time, but here we are with everything synced. You can see we've got the spy clock is coming from the Wave Runner. Our chip select is coming from the Siglent. Our uh, data bit 0 and 3 are coming from the SDA. Data bit 1 is coming from the Siglent, and data bit 2 is coming from the PicoScope. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see we've got a perfectly functional protocol decode. We've got the individual spy transmit and receive channels. We've got the quad spy decode. And then we've got the spy flash upper layer protocol looking at all of these channels and pulling data from one or the other as appropriate. And if we arm the trigger and power cycle the board, we will see some activity from the boot ROM. Stop that there. We can pull up the protocol analyzer and go back and look at whatever we saw that was interesting. And scroll through our traffic just like normal. So I pull up the history view. I'm not going to show all of them as they're a little bit redundant when you've got this many instruments, but we can just look at the history from, say, the Siglent and uh, move back and forth to look at previous or current waveforms. Whenever we select a historical waveform in one scope, uh, it synchronizes to the same corresponding waveform from any of the other instruments, and so we get a coherent view of the decode. And so if we see something that we think is interesting, we can mark that and we'll call that, say, stream header and we'll stick that right there. And again, that shows up in history. And that same point is referenced. If we look at history of the any, any of the other scopes, we'll see that same marker show up there. And so it works just like you were sitting in front of one instrument, except in this case, we're looking at four. Well, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next video.